Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ariel Weisberg. I'm a software engineer uh, at VoltDB. Uh, VoltDB is a uh, in-memory, durable, SQL, transactional, uh, shared nothing, linear scale-out database. Uh, we built it completely from scratch. Uh, it's focused on high-velocity OLTP. Uh, and I've been doing that for about five years, and so in that time, you know, had uh, a lot of things to do, uh, a lot of variety, um, building a SQL database from scratch. Um, so for this talk, which is really sort of a, a biographical session of um, what we had to do to deal with long tail latency so that we could meet uh, some new specific use cases. Um, this is going ahead without me. Why is this doing that? Okay, so um, I want to describe, you know, what are um, the nines, the long tail latency? Mm -hmm. So, like, what metric is it that I'm describing? So it's basically, um, if you have uh, a distribution of samples of, let's say, latency, um, what percentage of them are less than a given value? And I'm going to need this to not go ahead without me. Okay. All right, so you have a you know, collection of events you've recorded, um, let's say the latency of various database transactions. Um, and so what percentage of the recorded events are less than a given value? So if you have 100 samples um, and you sort them based on you know, latency, and let's say the 99th sample is 30 milliseconds, then the 99th percentile for that distribution of samples um, is at the 99th percentile is 30 milliseconds, and 99% of your transactions uh, were going to have completed in less than 30 milliseconds. And that 100th sample, um, given the metric and the question you're asking about the distribution, that could be five days, an hour, it could be 31 milliseconds. Um, so service level agreements are kind of uh, an expression of the expectation of how long you think tasks are going to take uh, in your business process, in your system, whatever you're working with. Um, you've got tasks that deliver value um, for whatever your program does. Um, it's really going ahead without me. God. Okay. Um, so every application uh, has these expectations. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think about them. Um, oh, this really sucks. Uh, so every application has, uh, has these expectations. Um, and so one example of an SLA would be 99% of all tasks complete in less than 30 milliseconds uh, with a maximum of one second at an arrival rate of, let's say, 50,000 tasks a second. Um, and what's often left off uh, is you know, the arrival rate. This is didn't do this before. How do I, anyone know how to delete the timing so it doesn't do this? Any uh, PowerPoint gurus? Ah, oh, here we go, use timings. Let's get rid of that. All right. Okay, um, back to you know, what's involved in, uh, in, a, in a fairly complete SLA. So um, you, a lot of SLAs will, uh, sometimes people come to us, they'll give us a percentile, um, but they won't get, and um, maybe a maximum, but they frequently leave off the arrival rate, um, as well as, you know, over what period is this SLA valid? Um, and even the specifying an arrival rate as like 50,000 transactions a second, that's incomplete in and of itself. Um, in the real world, tasks don't arrive uh, in an even or normal distribution. Um, and so the nines um, that I'm going to be talking about are uh, the different ways where those expectations are violated, where um, you aren't meeting your SLA, and um, sometimes it's actually sneakily. Your measurements may even be hiding that. Um, and so Jill Teen has a great talk that he gave, um, How Not to Measure Latency, um, talking about um, various measurement errors in determining uh, you know, what your latency is, um, even if you're doing it correctly, let's say using a histogram. So uh, some common latency metrics. Um, there's minimum, which is mostly useless outside of sanity checking, um, but it's really useful um, to make sure that you actually have a valid distribution of samples. If you have a bunch of zeros in your distribution, um, that's a telltale sign that you're not measuring what you're thinking you're measuring, and that's going to pull down uh, the, uh, the high latency, the maximum, and latency at higher percentiles. Uh, so there's average. Um, and then there's also average plus standard deviation. Um, and so both of these are um, sort of have limited utility, when, especially when used incorrectly. So if you have an average, you could have a five-minute period where no transactions are done, 
in a 24-hour period. If your average is over, spans 24 hours, um, you're not going to see the, the five-minute period where your service was down. And you've got a similar problem with standard deviation. Standard deviation will tell you a little more. It'll tell you that, hey, yeah, there was some skew. But again, over a long enough period of time, standard deviation is also not going to be uh, very informative. Um, so a better way uh, to measure long tail latency is using uh, histogram. So you get a complete picture of what actually occurred. Um, and so the problem with uh, histograms is most naive implementations are fixed range buckets. Um, and they're not very space efficient. And they also aren't very accurate. They don't have a lot of precision. So uh, Jill Teen, who gave the talk I mentioned, and also uh, Michael Barker uh, created an open source histogram implementation. Um, it's got a configurable space precision trade-off, so you can set the range. Um, so you can express something like microseconds to days um, in a low hundreds of kilobytes with three digits of precision. Um, you could do that in tens of kilobytes if you're willing to give up on uh, significant digits. Uh, it's extremely fast. Uh, it's easy to query some indifference when you have multiple consumers. So if you log your histograms over time, um, you can to, you can choose what span of time you're going to be reporting over. Uh, it's also easier for consumers to maintain their own, own private copies of these histograms um, that they can query in different ways. Uh, and this is available in Java and C++. Um, and one of the reasons, the things I want to touch on is, you know, why, why should you care about long tail latency? If your average is good, if your throughput is good, uh, what's the issue? So the latency uh, of your user visible tasks, the ones that are delivering actual business value, it's a function of the latency of all the subtasks. And as the number of subtasks increases, um, the latency of tasks approaches that of the long tail. So I actually had a benchmark and a whole bunch of slides to demonstrate this. But basically, you really rapidly approach you know, your worst case latency um, as, as you start adding subtasks that have a distribution with outliers. Um, and the other issue is that correlated spikes in latency can cause cascading failures. So when you do have outliers, they're typically correlated across multiple unrelated things because those outliers are caused by some shared, contended, buggy resource. So the starting point um, for us with the VoltDB was to figure out, well, what's the limit? You know, how, what can we aim to accomplish uh, in terms of long tail latency, given the tools we've picked and the architecture we have? So it's an in-memory database, um, which means there's no reason to tolerate I.O. pauses. So we're never going to have to read data from disk. We do have to write data to disk uh, for persistence purposes, but with the amount of RAM available today, uh, it basically all should be buffered. We should never have to wait on a, on a disk in order to respond to a transaction. Uh, it's written in Java. Um, and being written in Java means you're going to have to tolerate young generation garbage collection pauses. Um, you're also going to have to tolerate um, less frequent and relatively small still old generation pauses. Um, and VoltDB is also built on Linux. So we're going to have to accept um, whatever environmental noise is introduced by Linux and also the hardware we're deployed on. Um, and so you'd think that that would work out pretty well. Um, high frequency traders use Linux, and they have very little tolerance for variance. Um, but what we sort of found was that when you're doing I.O., even not depending directly on I.O., when there's other threads somewhere on the system doing a lot of I.O., you tend to see a lot of noise. So drilling more into um, how I got at those expectations for garbage collection. Um, so for young gen garbage collection, um, you, can, you can get the frequency of this to be you know, once a second or less. Uh, and by less, I mean you know, every five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever you need. You can run you know, feasibly very large young generations. Um, and uh, this is a combination of tuning garbage collector settings. And then it's also designing your application um, to elicit good behavior from the garbage collector. Um, and the actual garbage collection times can be tuned to the order of single digit milliseconds. So young gen collections, um, depending on how you structure your application and what settings you use, um, can actually be in the tens of milliseconds or more. So for the old generation garbage collector, um, so this is a frequency that you can design your application so that it's really on the order of days. Basically, if anything might get promoted and it's not going to live the entire life of the application, um, you don't actually expose it to the garbage collector. You do something else. Um, never is a possibility. So you can write an application that basically will never run an old generation garbage collection. And you can do that for the young generation as well. Um, but then you're not writing Java. 
So you really have to question your choice of tools. You're working around all the goodness that you're getting um, from your choice of language and libraries. And so the time uh, of old generation garbage collections, that's something that you can get down to the tens of milliseconds. So the expectations for the database as a whole, what kind of SLA can we expect um, if we do our part as software developers? Um, so at a very high percentiles, five nines, um, single digit milliseconds. And that's going to be dominated by the cost of young gen collections, because every once in a while, we're not going to be able to answer some percentage of transactions because the garbage collector is running. Um, the maximum, so the absolute worst case behavior, uh, is going to be dominated by um, the old generation. So those garbage collections, um, we can feasibly you know, defer them to the order of days, but to eliminate them entirely um, is very difficult, because there's a huge, there's huge tracks of code that can't store their data on the heap. So the starting point um, for us for performance work was just continuous integration. And for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of shops, that's actually going to be continuous monitoring and production, because you may not have uh, the same in a continuous integration process. Um, so improvements don't stick without monitoring. So we could do all the work in the world um, to get our performance up and latency down at high percentiles, but it's not going to stick. So we have 120 different key performance indicators that we track um, for a variety of different workloads. Um, and we really need these key performance indicators to signal when they need attention. So if you're actually monitoring the state of your entire product in many different dimensions, you're not going to have time to um, review the results on a daily basis. Uh, and the key performance indicators need to visualize uh, in a way that highlights changes that we care about. So, and this is because bad news becomes uh, fractions of a percent at a time. So you know, you'd, you're lucky when it's a big performance drop. That's, that means you only have one flaw to fix, right? But if new, bad news comes fractions of a percent at a time, um, you have to catch those regressions quickly so you can correlate them with the ongoing uh, code changes and activity. So this is uh, the way the uh, index we have into all our performance graphs. And so you can see they're all annotated. Um, based on their 90-day history, uh, they're color-coded with arrows whether they need attention. Um, this is a couple different workloads. So each of these graphs um, is different performance dimensions, typically throughput and latency. Um, so you can see that it's specifying uh, here in red that the metric we care about, one of the uh, latency is the one that has regressed based on its past history. Um, and so these charts, it's also important to scale your charts correctly. So these charts don't start at zero. They start where the data set becomes interesting so that we can actually see small changes. Again, uh, bad news comes fractions of a percent at a time. Uh, and this would be an example of like how we check long tail latency. So we have a couple different workloads. Um, and so our, the SLA that we're checking internally is one second periods. So over one second, all the one second periods in a one hour benchmark at, at uh, you know, five nines, 99.999th percentile, um, what was the highest one? What was the worst case behavior? Um, and so in this case, you can see uh, for this particular workload, it doesn't uh, do anything I.O. related, so the number is nice and low, um, somewhere below probably 25 milliseconds. Um, and so once, you know, once you've got visibility into where you stand, um, you know, it's a good time to start looking at, well, now what am I going to do to make it better? Um, and so for VoltDB, um, this turned into outlier whack-a-mole. So you can sometimes have an application where um, you have good latency most of the time, periods of higher latency, and then you have periods where everything just, the wheels fall off. Um, and so for Volt, there wasn't so much periods of sustained higher latency. It was, there's very small periods where the wheels just fall off. Um, so outliers are caused by things that don't occur all the time. Um, and what I found was that there is huge, huge breadth to the root causes for outliers. Um, so there are things like uh, bugs. You know, so there's no reason to suffer an outlier because of a bug. It's typically a small change. So it's something like someone is holding a lock while doing a long-running task, and they have that lock is not even covering any data that that task cares about. Uh, there's design issues, so things that were just never going to work and have to be completely rewritten. So that's one example. It might be um, using some of the currently available old generation garbage collectors. Um, there's doing the right thing, but you're just doing it in the wrong way. And there's some simple patterns for fixing that. So you could do disk I.O. from the wrong thread, um, have the, another thread do the disk I.O., get a listenable future or a future, and process that when it's complete. 
Um, there's batch work, deferred work, where you have work you do not on every task, but you do you know, in aggregate periodically. So you have batch sizes that are so large that they show up in the overall response time. Or maybe that batch work could be done on a different thread. Um, so I have this list here, which is just some of the things we've encountered. Most of them we've been able to address. Um, different sources of outliers. It's not paranoia when the world is out to get you. Um, just one of my favorite examples, um, if you use the Java management extensions. So Java management extensions will instantiate Java RMI, um, and Java RMI will call system GC every hour, whether you need it or not. Um, and that would be, OK, that's bad. You're getting an old gen garbage collection every time. But on top of that, system.gc, even if you've selected a concurrent garbage collector, does a compacting collection, a full GC, which is you know, much, much larger. So when you have you know, such breadth and root causes, visibility becomes really important. Visibility into your application, visibility into the environment. Because um, every latency outlier has a cause, and the challenge is finding the cause. Um, and just like with continuous integration, automating the process of collecting metrics and running you know, benchmark workloads um, is, is really important. Um, it's really tough to, um, you know, this latency spike, if any random developer on your team is going to go track that down and find out what it was, is he going to have to learn the black arts of benchmarking, configuring the hardware, that specific workload, provisioning the hardware. Um, and then when you've automated the process of collecting performance information, um, you actually get a history. So if you only discover a latency spike later on, you can try and binary search back to when that may have started um, and correlate it with code changes. So this is um, one of the other performance graphs we generate. So every performance run that we, uh, we do, uh, we collect all the artifacts that are output. So logs, outputs from a benchmark client. Um, and so for the long tail latency benchmarks, uh, one of the graphs we make um, is the latency for all the one second periods. So each of these data points is a one second period. And it's the latency at the at five nines for that one second period. So you can see there's some really big spikes here. This is uh, one of the early graphs before we did any optimizations. Um, and so the graph, you can, you can zoom in. It's interactive, HTML. Um, and so you can see that at this one second spike, it's actually tagged um, with events from the server logs. And so it says that the, a distributed snapshot was started. So you can correlate between activities of the server um, that you know about with um, uh, with spikes in latency as witnessed by your benchmark client. Um, and that's useful for you know, things that your server is already reporting on. So if, you can, if you're lucky enough to report uh, you know, an event on the server, then you can do that kind of correlation. Um, but if you're going in blind, um, Oracle has a super nice product called Flight Recorder. Uh, it's a continuous profiler that you get suitable for use in production or in benchmark scenarios. Um, three to five percent overhead. Um, it gives you CPU sampling. Um, and one of the special things about uh, how they implement CPU sampling is that uh, it doesn't sample at safe points, um, which it actually samples thread stacks asynchronously without waiting for them to arrive at um, predetermined locations in the code. Um, so you get a little bit more accuracy. Um, it does a lot of the usual um, uh, profiling things. So like it shows monitor contention, time spent with threads parked, waiting, um, it actually times every single network and disk I.O. So you can see if there's an outlier. Uh, and it also uh, does the usual GC reporting. So it logs every garbage collection and lets you visualize a lot of different information about it. And one of the super nice things about it is that it's free for non-production use. So you can't run it in production, but you could run it in test. Um, and the, the thing I find most useful about Flight Recorder is that I can always, almost always, plumb the data in Flight Recorder to find out what thread was supposed to be doing work because it contributes to response time, but it didn't. It was doing something else. Um, so I have a couple screenshots. Like This shows um, one of the views for garbage collections. Um, and you can actually sort um, collections by pause time. Um, at the top, there's actually a timeline. And so you can zoom in on the timeline to just the events recorded by Flight Recorder um, for a specific, uh, specific range. And if you can correlate that with latency spikes recorded by your client, um, you can really get a huge amount of visibility into what your threads were doing at that time. Um, so there's um, 
Another view of GC, this actually shows uh, different attributes of the GC phases. Um, some of those other tabs will give you starting and stop, um, you know, heap sizes. Um, this is uh, sort of a typical profiler monitor view, so you can get stack traces uh, for all the entry points into the monitor and, you know, the count of who was blocked how many times and for what duration on that. Um, and so this is useful, like if you've got, if someone's blocked on a monitor and that's what's causing your latency outlier, um, that'll show up here. Um, this is uh, socket I.O., and this is actually showing um, a write, uh, 10 writes to a non-blocking socket with a total duration of 1.6 seconds. So socket is not so non-blocking. Um, so I want to segue uh, back into garbage collection. Um, so I got uh, some micro benchmarks I put together. Um, so previously mentioned garbage collection expectations. So how did I arrive at those? So in old gen, uh, Garbage collection, tens of milliseconds every number of days. Young gen, single digit milliseconds um, at every number of seconds. Uh, and so how do you make garbage collection fast or not have outliers? So you can not ask it to do work. So work you do yourself uh, through some other mechanism as work it doesn't have to do. Um, but you can also not ask it to do stuff it's bad at. Um, so old generation garbage collection. Um, I don't think it really meets the expectations of an in-memory database, um, and not all of them. So I'd say I'm specifically talking about state-of-the-art JDK7, um, so where, where that really means either concurrent mark sweep or G1. Um, so first of all, the pauses themselves are too long, not good enough to have happen on a regular basis. Having that have happen every five minutes, every 10 minutes is not viable. Um, fragmentation leads to pauses that are orders of magnitude worse. So uh, I think really, unlike the young gen collector, which, collector, which generally seems to behave fairly consistently, um, there are really bad worst case scenarios where the garbage collector has so much fragmentation that it has to do a compacting collection that is many, many times slower, tens of seconds instead of milliseconds. Um, so Azul Zing, uh, Azul is a company, Zing is a JVM, and they uh, offer an alternative that uh, technically is very viable, um, but you know, as a product company, um, there's deployment friction. Every time someone downloads their product, tries it out, um, and they're not using Zing, they don't see the product in its best light. Uh, and then there's sales friction. So every dollar that we give to Zing for their wonderful uh, JVM, um, we don't have ourselves. And then it just becomes you know, cost benefit. How much does it cost us to work around not being able to use the old generation versus how much we would have to spend um, to purchase Zing? And so for us, we, we decided it was better to have a have us work awesome on Oracle JDK. But you know, that's something that you have to figure out yourself. Um, some applications, it's not easy to avoid using the old generation. If you have lots of code, complex, diverse object graphs, that's not something that's necessarily easy to represent off heap. Um, so the sh long and the short of it, um, we only use the old generation for small and frequently changing data, mostly stuff that happens at startup or um, maybe once per connection. Um, for most code, this preserves the goodness of Java and garbage collection. So we're really not giving up that much. Um, and I'm going to go into uh, some of the things we had to do. Um, and once you've done that, you can run a small old generation. Um, and anything that might promote it, we just make sure we store off heap. So we can use memory map files, um, direct byte buffers to access memory, um, and sometimes unsafe for small corner cases. Uh, I don't generally recommend it. So I haven't really justified yet. Um, why, with you know, any concrete numbers, why I think uh, old generation garbage collection isn't viable. But I can actually demonstrate that just using um, a couple of young generation garbage collection uh, micro benchmarks. So Alexei Rogozin has a great blog post um, about you know, what goes into the cost of a young generation garbage collection. So um, most young generation collectors um, in the JDK are copying collectors. Well, I'll, I'll say most. So the parallel, concurrent mark sweep, and G1. Um, and so what do you pay for? So you pay for copying the live objects, because it's a copying collector. That's pretty straightforward. Um, there's card scanning. So card scanning uh, is a heuristic um, that the garbage collector uses so it doesn't have to scan the entire old generation for pointers to the young generation when it does a young gen GC. Um, so the cards are just sort of uh, you know, a table representing pages of memory uh, in the old generation, and the, ta the cards are marked when, when the old generation is modified. Uh, and then there's old gen scanning. 
which is actually using the cards, the cards that are marked, scanning the old generation to find uh, uh, odd pointers. And then there's stack scanning. So your thread stacks are roots for garbage collection. It's how your Java application finds reachable objects, or one of the, one of the ways. Um, and so that, that's also where some of the time goes. So I'm not going to tackle old gen scanning. Uh, it's usually not such a big cost. Um, and I'm going to start with card scanning uh, and demonstrating that overhead. So I wrote a small micro benchmark, um, which uh, you can find on Pastebin. It's a single threaded application. It allocates random size arrays up to uh, randomly between 0 to a kilobyte, stores them in a map of linked list by size, um, and then uses a queue to remove the allocations out of the map in first in, first out order. So oldest objects are always getting um, released first. Um, and I vary the, num the number of allocations retained. So I'm basically varying the working set size of my young generation. Um, and then constantly cycling objects through them to force the collector to run. Um, so the next graph uses concurrent mark sweep. Um, and that's necessary to demonstrate the overhead of card scanning. Um, but the rest of them I ran with the default parallel collector. Um, so this is um, the application I just described, which is cycling through a working set of eight megabytes. Um, and the three different bars are different old generation sizes. Um, so I had a one gig old generation, an eight gig old generation, and a 12 gig one. So this is just running on a quad core desktop. Um, and so these, there's nothing in this old generation. It's completely empty. Um, nothing's getting promoted. I checked, I you know, enabled GC logging. Um, but you can see that the GC time is growing just by having to do, um, I believe, the card scanning. So I don't have logging from the JVM that says, you know, percentage of GC card scanning doing that. Um, but that's what I believe is happening. Um, and so this, uh, this graph, um, now I'm varying the working set size. So how many megabytes of data do I retain inside the young generation? And, and it varies between 8 and 256 megabytes. Uh, and so what this is measuring is the overhead of copying live objects. Um, and so it's pretty straightforward, and it's kind of what you would expect. You pay a linear cost for the number of objects that need to be copied. Um, so this one is a little bit more esoteric. So this is looking at the overhead of scanning thread stacks for GC roots as part of a young gen collection um, to, find la to find live objects. So I created a variable number of sleeping threads. Um, and the threads are sleeping at the top of a variable size stack. Um, so this stack is just grown through recursive function calls. Um, and then there's a thread that's just allocating memory to trigger garbage collections. Um, and so these stack, the stack size, it's just a relative stack sizing. It has no correlation to actual recursion depth. Um, stack frames are not uniform in size. You can have more fields on the stack, less fields. So first, I held the number of threads constant. So this is just varying in recursion depth. So with 2,000 threads, you could sort of see that really up to, what is it, uh, 64 threads, somewhere between 64 and 128, 128 threads, you start to see more of a penalty. Um, and, uh, and then you know, up to 512, you start seeing enough milliseconds tacked on that this might be something you care about if your goal, like in my case, you know, I say single digit young gen garbage collections, my goal is less than five, preferably three or four, because uh, I think that's something that's realistically attainable. So then I kept the stack size constant, uh, and I varied the number of threads. Um, and that arrives at the exact same point at the end, right? Because it's doing the exact same amount of work. And so there's certainly an inflection point where it starts getting worse a little faster. I imagine that might have something to do with cache sizes. Um, so what would GC guided design be for an application? If you wanted to make an application that plays well with the garbage collector and you're giving up on the old generation. So, you want a modest number of threads, where modest is still pretty generous. You can probably run quite a few threads, lots, lots of stacks. Um, although, with lots of active threads, there could be issues with time to save point. Um, but uh, that's kind of out of scope. Um, so for the young generation, you want the smallest working set possible. You want to reduce that copying overhead. So for the old generation, um, you want to reduce card scanning overhead. Um, and if you're not using the old generation, it's not a big deal. But if your strategy to avoid old gen garbage collections is, I'm going to allocate a huge old generation, well, you're going to see that um, in your young gen collections. So there's no free lunch there. Um, and I think that uh, really working set size is actually one of the hardest things to control, and not necessarily the old generation and getting stuff off the heap. Um, and so the reason is that your working set um, is a function of the, how long your tasks are and how many of them you need to run concurrently. So if your tasks 
are calling out to you know, downstream systems and with multiple batches and they take you know, 200 millis, to really saturate um, your front end instance, you're gonna have to run a lot of them concurrently. And all that state is gonna have to be visible to the young generation collector. Um, so going off heap. Um, so for VoltDB, our storage engine was always in C++. Uh, we use Java for stored procedure execution uh, and distributed coordination and so on. Um, so we have a persistent binary deck, which is basically uh, a queue, but you put in binary objects. Um, and so it allows us to have um, larger than memory storage, um, persistence across restarts. Uh, and basically, every use case we have of the using the old generation, um, it, was, it was pretty much uh, a queue and something where we could just marshal the objects, put them off the heap, and then grab them back. And so you're burning a few extra CPU cycles, but you're saving uh, outliers from the old generation collector. Um, so there's uh, Chronicle, which is similar. Uh, it has it's higher performance, works with smaller objects, more, has, a, has a concurrency strategy. Um, so Peter Lowry uh, has sort of an interesting collection of projects in, under the name OpenHFT, um, and he wrote Chronicle. Um, and there's several off-heap data structures there. So if you're interested in moving things off-heap, you can Google off-heap data structure. It's a thing now. Um, and you'll find some interesting stuff. And then there's, you know, Peter Lowry has this blog post showing some really crazy things you can do to actually try and create objects or things that look like objects off the heap. Um, so once you're starting to move stuff off heap and you're using native memory or memory map files, um, there are some challenges. So first of all, direct byte buffers or mapped byte buffers rely on garbage collection to deallocate native memory. But we're not doing old generation collections anymore. So frequently when you're you know, working with a file, you map a large quantity of that file and it sticks around for a while while you're writing to it. Um, and so that's gonna get promoted to the old generation. Um, so one shortcut um, is you can use a private interface, um, a proprietary that's not part of the JDK officially, called direct buffer to get a cleaner. A cleaner is a, a, just a function for, or an object with a deallocation policy for whatever you're working with. Um, and they're synchronized, they're thread safe, they're item potent, so they're relatively safe to work with. It just exposes you to use after free because you have reachable objects that you've just invalidated. Um, and then there's also the maximum direct memory size. If you're gonna start allocating um, a lot of direct byte buffers, um, the default maximum is uh, the same as your heap size. So one of the other issues is once you start doing manual memory management, um, you're in the sort of manual memory management pain world without RAII or um, any of the tooling that you would normally get uh, in a native application. So there's no Valgrind. So what we found really helpful was wrapping native memory in a container. Um, and so this container class can provide a couple things. So it can track double free. There's a discard method that specifies the deallocation policy. We needed that anyways because a lot of times the allocation policy isn't known to the, deallocation policy isn't even known to the person using the data. Um, it can track use after free, so it's got an accessor method that checks to make sure it hasn't been deallocated already. Um, and we can use leak detection, uh, so the, BB, the container can implement a finalizer, um, and we can use that. Uh, and then there's tag trails, so you can tag a container saying, yeah, I touched this. Um, and then you can use conditional compilation to remove all these extra debugging fields. Um, and we found that conditional compilation was necessary because there's no real way to get the JVM to optimize out fields conveniently. Um, and so the uh, the uh, use after free, double after free, we actually use stack traces for all of these. So like uh, if you double free, you will get the stack of the person who allocated the memory, the person that deallocated it, and the person who deallocated it a second time. Um, so it's generally uh, enough information to tell you what subsystem you're looking at. Um, so just briefly talking about Linux. Um, so I talked a lot about the JVM and that environment and how to make that work. Um, so for Linux, for us, the visibility has been really poor. We have nothing like Flight Recorder. Um, so we generally only have to work around blocking system calls. Um, and all of them seem to be blocking at one point or another. Um, it, it really doesn't engender a lot of trust. So we use victim threads for that because uh, it's a, VoltDB is a thread per core model. And so blocking our event threads um, has a direct impact on response time. Um, and the worst offender is buffered I.O. So you're supposed to be able to write to a file in Linux, and you're not actually writing to the disk. You're writing to uh, memory in the page cache. Um, and writes block in all kinds of conditions. Um, we also found that um, XFS and EXD4 produce very different latency graphs from our product. 
Um, but like if you look in Flight Recorder, there is no thread that contributes to response time that is actually ever blocked on disk I.O. So it doesn't, and that's, that's by design, where you, we're never supposed to depend on the disk to promptly respond to a transaction. But if you switch file systems, you get a very different shape graph. Um, it's a little disturbing. Um, and we also found it's really helpful to turn off transparent huge pages and uh, zone reclaim mode. Um, those are the kind of kernel features where the kernel decides that it's going to do something now and you're going to have to wait. Um, so enough with uh, the environmentals. So not all pauses are caused by uh, the virtual machine or the OS, but you have the same visibility problem. Um, so Flight Recorder, uh, as nice as it is, it isn't always available. Um, so we are a product company. Other people deploy the product. It's difficult to get them to turn it on. Maybe they can't because they haven't paid for it. Um, and Flight Recorder has a limited understanding of your application. So you can sometimes um, get a little bit, a lot of useful information uh, other ways. So canaries are what I'm calling these. It's kind of like the poor person's flight recorder, um, or maybe the precise person. So we, assert, we add assertions in our applications, preconditions, postconditions uh, for correctness, and why not performance? Like if you expect something to always take a certain amount of time, um, you can check for that. So outliers are when those ex expectations are violated. You know, if you've actually taken the time to think about how things should work and you think it should be fast and it isn't, something somewhere is violating your expectations. Um, so you can code those up. You know, how long does it take to um, acquire a lock, read or write from a file, allocate memory, uh, et cetera? So um, implementation-wise, the canary is really simple, something you can throw together. So um, you have a method, a start method, that just returns a timestamp. Um, and so you can have that surrounded by a static final Boolean in case you want to disable it, because uh, grabbing a nanosecond precision timestamp in Linux um, is about 20 to 25 nanoseconds. Uh, it's linearly scalable, uh, but on some other platforms and JDK versions, it isn't necessarily. So it could have a performance impact. Um, and so then you do whatever work it is you want to measure, and then you call finish. You pass in the time it started, um, the message you want logged in the event that uh, it doesn't meet expectations, and the expected time it was supposed to take, the time unit. Um, and this is something that can be somewhat optimized away by the JIT. Um, it, it's still going to have an impact on inlining because those bytecodes are still going to be there, but um, it won't actually show up in the assembly. Um, and then the question is, well, what, what numbers do I feed my canaries? So this is sort of, you can start with like one of these charts on how long you think things are going to take. And even in this chart, like mutex lock unlock, uh, what happens if your thread gets unscheduled? Uh, it's, you know, it's a very, it's not a it's one specific value, it's a distribution. Um, and then the question is just where in the distribution do you want to have the alarm bells start going off? Um, so another useful technique that's less targeted, um, that's sort of a poor man's flight, another version of the poor man's flight recorder is watchdogs. So you have a thread, um, thread pets the watchdog, and as part of petting the watchdog, you know, the dog registers the thread, and then subsequently expects petting um, at a specific frequency. So if this thread um, is constantly running, and this works really well in an event looped system where um, you, know, you always expect things to be available. Um, if the thread comes late, the dog bites the thread, and the thread drops a stack trace. So this is going to be a stack trace at a safe point, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, and this works really well with steady synthetic workloads, um, because your threads are always busy, all of them. Um, you don't have any of them you know, idle for a while and setting off the watchdog incorrectly. Um, and so this is also something that could be compiled out by the JIT using a static final Boolean. Um, so it doesn't have to have a huge impact on performance when you're not using it. Um, so once you have like canaries or watchdogs, the problem is, is that they generate too much information because outliers persist or cluster um, and you know, you're going to flood the log. And so you just really want to know that these things are happening and roughly, you know, how many times once per second or per day are these things happening um, in, the, in an environment? Um, so you can rate limit log messages based on a format string. Um, and so enforcing this can be really fast and scalable. Um, so you have to do a hash, look, hash table lookup, which is the most expensive part. Um, but actually maintaining you know, the state of the last time the message was logged, um, the cache line for that is going to be in the shared state. Um, so you could have a ton of threads checking this condition all the time, and it's not going to be a scalability bottleneck. Um, and so all of these things were really important to us because we're doing debugging in production, and it, the product is deployed by other people. 
Um, we don't control the hardware, the software, or the network. Um, it's really difficult to acquire monitoring artifacts. So we get a lot of screenshots of various monitoring tools, but if you ask for the data, um, you typically don't get it, or you get it for the wrong time period, or missing some nodes. Um, sending us the logs has the highest odds of success, but even then, we had to write a tool to do it, so we would get all of them. Um, and so canaries are really helpful for if someone says, ow, this hurts, and you can't tell them why because you have no visibility. Um, but if the database says, yeah, that disk didn't respond for um, you know, 20 milliseconds, you can explain to them why they got a, data spi uh, a spike in latency. And then they're like, oh, I was SCPing a file that time. Um, so another useful tool uh, is Mesh Monitor. It's sort of inspired by JHiccup, another tool made by Jill Team. Um, and it solves the distributed version of the J-Hiccup problem. So J-Hiccup is sort of um, a, another kind of watchdog that's watching the entire environment um, that your application runs in. So you can run J-Hiccup as a separate process, or you can run it inside your JVM. Um, and what J-Hiccup does is it l tries to run a thread on a fixed interval. And if the thread doesn't get to run on time, um, then J-Hiccup will log that in a histogram, um, and then you can see how consistently your server is able to schedule a thread and do an arbitrary piece of work. Um, and so if you run it uh, independently, you're looking at the noise introduced by the environment. And if you're running it into your JVM, you're looking at the noise introduced by the JVM itself. So you can see garbage collections, compilation, et cetera. And so the mesh monitor is a distributed version of this. All processes connected via TCP mesh, um, their heart beating, um, and it measures with a histogram. So uh, you can see the accuracy of thread wake up, like in J-Hiccup, but you can also see the interval between receiving heartbeats, the delta between sent and received, um, and you can differentiate between node-wide pauses and network-wide pauses. Um, so I'm just going to blaze through this. Basically, so once you've s tackled the environment and let's say the APIs you use, what about your application design can cause outliers? So it usually comes down to the uniform task sizes or non-uniform task sizes. Um, so if all your tasks are the same size and you do them first in, first out, you're gonna get basically the best latency you're gonna get. Um, but if you have some tasks that are larger than others, um, either because they are larger or they have unrelated work, um, it's an issue. So for large tasks, you can reduce the task size. They only need to be big enough to amortize startup cost. Um, you can process, process them concurrently where possible. Um, limit the number of outlier tasks that can, that can be processed concurrently. So don't let um, the misbehaving tasks um, penalize the small ones, um, and enforce ratios or rate limits uh, where you can. So you can use Guava's rate limiter, uh, and we have like a minimum ratio maintainer, so when we have different classes of tasks, we can uh, maintain a minimum ratio so that we can ensure something makes progress while still um, servicing the uh, latency sensitive tasks. Um, and being able to weigh tasks is really helpful for this. Um, so whether you do that by looking at the task itself or looking at historical data, um, so for um, outlier tasks, so deferred work, there are a lot of things you can do to cause deferred work, like hash table resizes, cache expiration, um, garbage collection that's not managed by the JVM, flushing to the file system stuff periodically. So you do the same strategies as large tasks. Um, but like with hash tables, you can use an incremental resizing hash table. You could pre-allocate. If you don't know what to pre-allocate, you can look at the history of previous allocations and guess based on that. You can use a tree. Um, do cache expiration asynchronously, garbage collection, pick strategies that do um, that kind of thing incrementally. So every task contributes um, to the work in an even amount. Uh, and if you're going to flush to the file system, do it in a separate thread or preemptively prepare the file system state. So uh, make sure the file's the correct length, make sure all the pages have been touched. Um, so for us, um, getting to five nines. Um, so examining all one second periods, uh, where we started, um, we had uh, at five nines, it was several hundred milliseconds. Um, and so we ended with five nines under 80 milliseconds. And so, you know, it's, a, it's a still a work in progress, but, you know, this is. Uh, while we're building a failed node. So this is the worst case behavior of I've lost a node, so I've lost capacity, and I've lost more capacity because I'm trying to rebuild it. Um, but in regular operation, you know, five nines for one hour, we're at uh, 25 milliseconds now, and six nines were under 250 milliseconds. So, you know, going with my expectations earlier, you know, what the floor was, we're still not there, um, and that's because there's really no silver bullet. Um, so if we were going to continue working, it would probably be looking at like environmental noise from Linux, 
setting up OPROFILE, file, getting that into continuous integration so that we could see everything um, and not just the Java portion. Uh, do I have time for questions? All right. So uh, I haven't. I would say I have poor visibility into Linux due to lack of knowledge. It's not. Uh, it's more that we treat it as a black box, and we just have assumed, you know, that it's going to do the right thing. Um, and for you know various use cases, it has. Um, so that would be the answer. It's so. But now it's kind of like, well, we see a spike. There's none of our threads were listed as not running. So what happened? I'd like to see what all the kernel threads were doing at that time. What were they running? Um, any more questions? All right, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>